Right up. the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure how do you make your calling and election sure you can't jesus did now what this is referring to is that you have to study so you can learn that your calling and election are sure okay if you don't study you don't know, do you? I got to wipe my glasses off here. Um, nothing we can do can make our calling and election sure. Jesus has done that. Okay. Now, our job is to study and learn that our calling and election are sure. Let's look at this. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. You can't go through the procedure in verses 5, 6, and 7 and succeed and get to the point where you are charitable with your time, your talents, your resources, your money, your creativity, whatever God has blessed you to be able to give to others and give of yourself. It says, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence. See, that's the first, the first thing in our procedure in chapter, in uh, chapter one, verse five. See, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now you can give diligence to serve God, but your calling and election are sure because of what Jesus did for you, not because of what you can do for yourself. It says, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. If you are doing all these things that the procedure uh, outlines, then you are a child of God because those these things you are not capable of unless he is within you and gives you this ability to do this. Okay. In verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not because you do the works but because Jesus died for you, the works are the result of his presence within you. In verse 12, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, he's talking about his body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. In verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, he's saying he's going to die and he's going to leave his body. Knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So the Lord had showed him that he was going to be dying soon. In verse 15, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease 
to have these things always in remembrance. He wants his fruit to remain. And so it has. In verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's why their testimony has been included as scripture because these are eyewitness accounts and the Lord has inspired their testimony. In verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. Jesus did. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That happened a couple of times um, and also said, hear ye him. So the voice had come from heaven to verify the identity of the son of God in verse 18. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. And that would be the Mount of Transfiguration where you had Peter, James and John went up apart from the rest of the disciples and Moses and Elijah appeared on the mount, and then Jesus was transfigured before them and was communicating with Moses and Elijah. In verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. You know, the, the day star is Jesus Christ, not Lucifer. Okay? <laughs> he wishes. In verse 20, knowing, well, let's, let's look at this. We have, a, in 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. A more sure word of prophecy. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. It gives hope and encouragement. Until the day dawn. That's the, the day of Christ. The new millennium. And did you know that the new millennium starts September 10th? September 10th, which is one of our possible evacuation days between the 10th and the 11th, uh, September 10th is Tishrei 1, the uh, first day of the Jewish New Year. It is also the birthday of the world <laughs> and the start of the new millennium. September 11th, which is our other possibility, is nothing. It's Tishrei 2. Uh, it's probably the start of the New World Order. They love that day. You know how they love September 11th. In verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, what that means is that when the prophets were given these words from God, they were written down as God gave them and not as the prophet interpreted them. Okay? It's not saying that we can't read them and interpret them. It's saying that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So when the message was given to the prophets, they wrote it down word for word, having no clue what it meant. Okay. In verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is how God gave them the Holy Scriptures, and they wrote them down exactly as they were given and not according to how they, whether or not they understood them, uh, and they were not subject to the prophet's interpretation. So we can rest assured that the prophet didn't hear a message and then write it as he understood it 
rather than writing it word for word exactly as it was given to him. Let's go into chapter 2, verse 1 of 2 Peter. Ready? But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, there, this is telling us how to recognize false prophets and false teachers. It says, they privily shall bring in damnable heresies. That is anything that indicates that any element in any form is necessary in addition to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to complete our salvation. That is a damnable heresy. Another one would be that they deny the validity of the word of God. Okay, and it says here that these false teachers and false prophets deny the Lord that bought them. They, a false teacher and false prophet will never say Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. They will never do that. They deny the Lord that bought them and they bring upon themselves swift destruction. In verse 2 of 2 Peter chapter 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Let's look up the word pernicious. Oops. Having a harmful effect. This is what pernicious means. Having a harmful effect, especially in a gradual or subtle way. Reekage, huh? Now it says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. That means they have a harmful effect. Harmful, damaging, destructive, injurious, hurtful, detrimental, deleterious, dangerous, adverse. Um, inimical, unhealthy, unfavorable, bad, evil, wicked, malign. You get the idea, right? By reason, many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Do you think that the wicked religious leaders don't speak evil of Jesus by insinuating that anything coming from us is necessary to complete our salvation, they also insinuate and imply that the blood of the covenant that from the Holy One is unholy and insufficient or inadequate to save us. They add things, they add instructions for believers and apply them as conditions of salvation and it says many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and you know people are do, are asking questions like well if jesus is god uh you know why do i have to save myself and that's a good question isn't it in verse three and through covetousness shall they with feigned words, remember, feigned means to pretend. Through covetousness shall they with feigned words, they don't mean them, make merchandise of you. They want to convince you that they are a believer so they can make money off of you, so they can sucker you out of your hard-earned money and get you to send it to them whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. When you are planting your seeds and giving your tithes and offerings, plant them in good ground if you want to return. And that's the idea, isn't it? 
You want to return when you're planting seeds. You want something to grow that's going to benefit you. You have to plant in good ground to do that. And if you plant in the ground of these ministries that waste your time begging you for money to stay on the air, then don't be surprised when your investment in them does not bring you a return. In verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, he was eighth in the line from Adam, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. See, he's created Sodom and Gomorrah and that situation and all the wicked within it to make them an example unto those who would thereafter live ungodly. You don't want to live ungodly. You want to pay attention to these examples that he has set up and demonstrated for us. In verse 7, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He's vexed by it. He didn't, he, he didn't agree with it, but he didn't pack up and leave either. In verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He should have gone out from among them, but he didn't. His wife was the problem. Lot's wife, her heart was in the city. She's the one that wanted to live in the city. Okay? And Lot had given her her way. And although he was vexed by the evil that was continually in his face there, he did stay, didn't he? In verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. You are not supposed to despise our government. We may not, you know, you may not agree with the president. Um, I like the guy personally. <laughs> I like President Trump way better than Obama because his policies are more friendly to the American people. Mr. Obama's policies were more of a socialist, Marxist nature. Um, and that's not something I can ever support. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Look at how these horrible uh, people are treating President Trump. It's a, it's a complete witch hunt all of the time, the way they do him. They can't take him down, so they want to take his lawyers down, his assistants, his appointees. He wants, you know, they can't, they haven't been able to take him down, so they just want to take down anyone who's faithful around him. In verse 11, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. In verse 12, now see, that's how things are done. And just like the snake in a dress, Pope Francis, he sits on a throne with a crown on his head in the house of God, showing himself that he is God. He doesn't have to do anything more to defile the new Jewish temple than he's doing right now in the Vatican. Did, do you, have you ever known a religion on the face of the earth who has the unmitigated gall to put their leader of their church on a throne with a crown and people coming and bowing down to him like he's God? It's really messed up. Come out of her, my people, says the Lord. That is... a the real believers are leaving the false churches in droves 
and the fakes are leaving the true churches at the same time. In verse 12, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Did you hear that? Made to be taken and destroyed. Did it sink in? Made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not. They do this and God programs them to do this because they are tempting you, not God isn't tempting you, they are tempting you to do the same thing. And they shall utter and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They are not going to be saved if they are not children of God, if they are not born with the temple inside them. In verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. Remember what righteousness is? Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Well, this says, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. If righteousness is believing God, unrighteousness is a failure to believe God. They, it is unbelief. As they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. These are the tares. These are false believers who come in privily and they are spots and blemishes. The word says that the Lord will have a perfect church without spot or blemish. Now that, uh, for years, I was taught that means that spots and blemishes were our faults and failures. Uh, no, they're not. Obviously, right here, this scripture is showing us what the spots and blemishes are. They are those who sport themselves with their own deceivings. They don't really believe God, but they'll come and say and lie and say they do believe God because they want uh, to sell you something or they want you to give them something. They want something from you, which is why they lie. It says they sport themselves with their own deceivings. For them, it's fun. Christian bashing is fun to them. They sport themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They smile to your face and then they laugh at you behind your back while they take your money. In verse 14, having eyes full of adultery, they don't live for God. They're womanizers. They are philanderers. They are uh, adulterers and guilty of all kinds of depravity. And that cannot cease from sin. Did you hear that? Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. They can't do it. They can't cease from sin. They are created to be an example of sin, and then they are destroyed. Beguiling unstable souls. See, they're not beguiling stable souls, only unstable souls. When we come back, we're going to start in this verse one more time. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14. Right up.